I invite you to take God's Word and turn with me to the book of 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3. And I want to begin by reading verses 16 and 17, which will be a launching point for us in this message. The title that I have been assigned is this, Is the Bible Just Another Book? 2 Timothy 3, I want to begin in verse 16, I think addresses this issue directly. And it needs to be before us and deeply embedded in our heart and in our soul. The Word of God reads, all Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. I want to begin by asking you this question, why do you believe that the Bible is the Word of God? Why do you believe that this book is not just another book? Why are you convinced that the Bible is a supernatural book written by our sovereign God? That is a very important question before each and every one of us here today. And from a divine perspective, we believe that the Bible is God's Word because its author, the Holy Spirit, has borne witness to our spirit and to our hearts that this book contains the very voice of the living God to us. It is the Holy Spirit who has convinced us of the veracity of Scripture. The Spirit has brought its inward testimony into our hearts, and He has persuaded us that this book is like no other book in the world, that this book is God's book. And this is an inside witness that the author himself, the Holy Spirit, has brought home to our hearts. But this does not mean that there are no rational supports for this conviction. There are many sound evidences and many convincing proofs that the Bible is God's Word. Our faith is built upon facts. The foundation of our faith is this book, and there are many convincing and compelling reasons why we believe that this book is like no other book. Now, it still requires a step of faith, but I trust that as a result of our time together for this session, that you will see that it is a reasonable step of faith. In this message, I want to present the case why the Bible is God's Word. The rational argument should be known by each one of us here today. There needs to be more going in our heads than simply, I was raised this way, or I was brought up this way, or I went to VBS as a child, and I just always have, a, have believed that this book is the Bible. There needs to be some strong pillars that uphold our convictions that the Bible is the very Word of God. So I want to lay out for you ten reasons why we believe the Bible is the Word of God. I would urge you even to write these down in your Bible, to have these inside the front cover, on the back cover, as a reference point to come back to again and again that, yes, this is why I am persuaded that the Bible is the Word of the living God. And reason number one, we want to begin at the most basic entry-level place. And number one is the direct claims of the Bible. The Bible is authoritative in all matters that it addresses, and this includes its own direct claims about itself. The Bible actually claims to be the Word of God. This is not something that we are hoisting onto the Bible. 
And when a defendant is brought into a courtroom, he is allowed to testify for himself. In this passage, 2 Timothy 3 and verse 16, we read, all Scripture is inspired by God. And the Bible claims not to be the word of men, not to be the word of culture or society. The Bible claims to be God-breathed. The uh, ESV translates it, breathed out by God. Uh, this word, inspired by God, these three words, come from one Greek word, theonoustos. Theos for God. Noustos is breath or spirit. Theonoustos means God breathed, that God literally breathed out the Scriptures as it was recorded by secondary human authors. This verse says nothing about God inspiring the authors. Uh, the authors, as we were taught so well in our last session, were moved by the Holy Spirit, Second Peter 1, verse 21. But this does not say that the authors were inspired. This says that the text of Scripture is inspired. Now, the Scripture is not breathed into by God such that what men wrote suddenly became inspired. Rather, what this is saying is that all Scripture is breathed out by God. God is the source. God is the ultimate author of Scripture. The Bible is the product of the divine breath. Scripture is the product of the supernatural divine operation. Over 2,000 times in the Old Testament, we read statements like this. Thus says the Lord, or the Lord said, or something like this, the word of the Lord came to me saying, or the law of the Lord, or the precepts of the Lord. Again and again and again, we read these direct claims by Scripture. I will put my words in your mouth, says the Lord. And when we come to the New Testament, we, we read verses that are equally emphatic. We read, for example, in 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 15, for this we say to you by the word of the Lord. The authors were very aware that their message did not originate within themselves. It was not dredged up from the culture or the society, but that this is a transcendent message that is coming down out of heaven through their pen to us. And moreover, we read statements like this in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23. For I received from the Lord that which I delivered to you. And moreover, when we compare Old Testament verses with New Testament verses, many times what God says in the Old Testament, it is recorded as the Scripture says it in the New Testament, or the flip-flop. And so God and the Scripture speak with one voice because Scripture is the voice of God. Augustine and Calvin both said, when the Bible speaks, God speaks. So this is where we begin, the direct claims of Scripture. The Scripture is, is very crystal clear. This book is the Word of God. Now, second, the perfect unity of the Bible. Now, the more one studies the Bible, the more we are impressed with the amazing unity in the midst of its diversity. And Dr. Thomas touched on this in our last lesson, and I want to stand on his shoulders just for a moment and, and elaborate just a little bit with this. Now, the amazing diversity of the Scripture, 66 different books written over a period of some 15 to 1600 years over 40 different authors on three different continents writing in three different languages. Consider the diversity of the authors. Two were kings, three were priests, one was a physician, two were fishermen, two were shepherds, one was a former Pharisee, two were statesmen, 
One was a tax collector. One was a military general. One was a scribe. One was a cupbearer. And one was a goat herder. And consider the diversity of the literary genre with which they wrote. There's narrative, poetry, prophecy, proverb, parable, gospel, epistle, allegory, song, legal writings. Consider the diversity of where they were when they wrote the Bible. The Sinai Desert, the palace of Jerusalem, a cave in Judea, the palace of Shushan, beside the river of Babylon, the land of Egypt, Macedonia, Greece, Rome, a barren island on, uh, known as Patmos, and the diversity of its many parts. Uh, there are almost 3,000 different cast members in the storyline of the Bible, spanning some 1,189 chapters comprising some 31,000 verses, requiring 700,000 words, containing three and a half million letters. And yet, despite this complex diversity, this book speaks of one plan of salvation, one people of God, one story of human history, one problem of mankind, one solution for this problem, one standard of morality, one design for the family, one chief object of, of, its, uh, of its message. It is always speaking with one voice. It never contradicts itself. How can you account for this unity in the midst of such vast diversity, and the only reasonable explanation that there is, is that there is one author who stands behind this entire book and has breathed it out, and that author is God Himself. Let me illustrate it this way. Suppose every state in the Union was asked to excavate its natural stone, box it in a crate, put it on a railroad car, and send it to the nation's capital. All 50 states would participate. Uh, there came crates containing limestone. Other states would send marble. Other states would send sandstone. Other states would send granite. Once those trains arrive in Washington, D.C., they are uncrated and they are all brought together. They seem to, be of, seem to be of different size and shape. Some are square, some are rectangular, some are cubical, some are uh, a cylinder form. And as they are brought together, all 50 stones interface perfectly and perfectly comprise a replica of the Jefferson Memorial Monument, with its domes, with its sidewalls, with its buttresses, with its arches, with its transepts, not a gap, not a flaw, nothing missing, a perfect, perfect fit. How would you account for that? Any thinking person who had two brain cells that might be touching one another between their two ears, the only explanation that you could come to is that there was a master architect behind the entire project who had sent out specific measurements for what he desired, and as it all came together, he oversaw the project that it would be fitted together, you would have to assume that there was one major architect. And so it is with the Word of God. Every doctrine, every truth, every principle, every practice, every standard of, uh, of ethics it all fitting together to form one temple of truth. It is the Word of the living God. Not to believe this would be synonymous with there being an explosion in a print shop, and all of the letters just happen to land on the ground and form the Oxford English Dictionary. 
without a mistake, in perfect alphabetical order, and without any misspelled words. Do you think that would just happen? Absolutely not. The Bible speaks with one voice on every issue that it addresses, and we as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we ought to have the greatest confidence and the strongest faith that this book is the inspired Word of the living God. I want to give you a third reason. The third reason is the reliable transmission of the Bible. Far more than any other book of an, uh, antiquity, the Bible has been passed down to us with extraordinary precision. Now, let's begin with the Old Testament. Until recently, the oldest known Hebrew manuscript of any length did not date earlier than the first part of the 10th century after Christ. And that would be a gap of some 13 to 1400 years. From the time of the writing of the last book of the Old Testament to the oldest copy of the Old Testament that we have. Let me state that again. A gap of some 13 to 1400 years. And then in 1947 and in 1948, there was a little shepherd boy in the northwest section of the Dead Sea. He was picking up some stones and chucking them into a cave like little boys would be prone to do, and he heard a thud noise inside that cave. He walked in to discover one of the great archaeological treasures of modern history, the Dead Sea Scrolls. And over the next months and the next period of time, they went into 11 different caves and they found contained a treasure that had been in there for some thousand years, precious copies of copies of the original text. There were two copies of Isaiah. There was an entire copy of the Psalms. There was an entire copy of the book of Leviticus, and there were thousands of, of fragments of different sections of the Old Testament. And when the Hebrew scholars gathered together, and when they saw this and began to piece these manuscripts together, in a moment, in an instant, our oldest copy of the Old Testament was pushed back a millennium back to the days virtually of the first century church. And what they discovered was an astonishing accuracy that over those thousand years, the transmission of the Word of God had been passed down with jaw-dropping accuracy. There is no other book of antiquity that has been so carefully passed down to us than this Bible, the Word of God. And the New Testament is even more so. We have almost 6,000 early Greek manuscripts of the New Testament and another 10,000 copies in the Latin Vulgate to say nothing of Syriac and other Semitic languages. We compare this with other ancient books written at the same time. It's really, it's really embarrassing. The full plethora of manuscripts that we have that substantiate the reliable transmission of the Word of God down to us in the entire copying process. Uh, for example, uh, let's just take Homer who lived 800 years B.C. There is a time gap between, between when he wrote what he wrote and the oldest copy of Homer some 400 years. With Plato, it is 1,300 years. With Caesar and his writings, 1,000 years. But when we come to the New Testament, the earliest document that we have that has pieces of the Old Testament, it's not 1,300 years, it's not a millennium, 
It's 50 years. And then the earliest copy of an entire New Testament, it's but some 200 years. And the copies are not six or seven, it's 6,000. No, the confidence that we should have in this book being passed down to us, it is unsurpassed for any books of antiquity at any level. Why do we believe that what we hold in our hand is the written Word of the living God? There is its direct claims. There is its perfect unity. There is its reliable transmission forth, the historical accuracy of the book. Uh, take for example the historical accuracy with which Mark wrote the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts. F.F. F. Bruce of the University of Manchester in England, in a work entitled, The New Testament Documents, Are They Reliable? Bruce writes, one of the most remarkable tokens of Luke's accuracy is his sure familiarity with the proper titles of all the notable persons who are mentioned in his pages. This was by no means an easy feat in his day, as it would be in ours, because he had it was not so simple to consult convenient books of reference. And Bruce goes on to talk about, as Luke records the, the book of Acts, not only is he geographically spot on at every point without having a, an atlas in front of him, but that as he addresses uh, the various titles of Roman officials, he does so with absolute perfection. And Bruce goes on to argue it would be like going to Oxford University your very first day on campus and being able to address everyone on faculty and everyone in higher administration by their proper titles, provost, master, rector, president. And many of the original uh, uh, Roman leaders, they were moving up the ladder and some of their titles were being changed. And every time that Luke records what, uh, what they were, he has it exactly right. Never a mistake historically. And the more the archaeologists begin to dig into the sand of the Middle East and they uncover treasures, they are not finding mistakes in the Bible. They are bringing confirmation of the historical accuracy of the Bible. Uh, they have un un uncovered the pool of Bethesda in John 5, verse 2, that for many years liberals said, see, the Bible is wrong. It cannot be correct because there is no pool of Bethesda. Oops. And the archaeologists have discovered it now, many feet below the surface, buried in the sand of time. The Bible is always correct. For years, the first five books in the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the liberals threw, threw every assault they could at this and said, well, there wasn't even uh, the use of language and letters that would allow someone to write to the Pentateuch at that time. Well, the archaeologists have discovered not simply that, yes, Moses was able to write that using the language of the day. There was a postal system that was functioning in that part of the world as people were writing and exchanging letters with one another. There has never been a book written in antiquity with the historical accuracy of the Bible. Now, let's move number five, the scientific accuracy of the Bible. This is what we would expect of a book that claims to be God-breathed. We would expect every subject matter that God addresses to be recorded with absolute perfection. Now, let's take the first book in the Bible, Genesis, or the very first verse in the Bible, Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. A very famous scientist, Herbert Spencer, who died in 1903, announced that everything in the universe fits into one of five categories, time, 
force, action, space, and matter. In the beginning, time, God, the force, created, that's action, the heaven, that's space, and the earth, that is matter. In the very first opening line of the Bible, there is this scientifically accurate statement that accounts for everything. Or for example, for many years, the scientists have said, the number of the stars in heaven. Hipp Hipparchus had wrote two centuries before Christ, as he looked up into the starry skies above, he counted the stars and he said, in the universe there are 1,022 stars. That's more than in Hollywood right there. And then Ptolemy, four centuries later, up to the time, said, no, you've miscounted. Two centuries after Christ, there are 1,056 stars. And then subsequently, a man named Kepler, writing 1,500 years later, accounted for 1,055 stars. That's what science accepted. That was the standard of the day in the scientific world of advanced learning. Until in 1610, Galileo, Galileo invented the telescope, and he put it up to his eye and looked into the sky above, and what he saw brought him to his knees. That there is an inestimable number of stars in the heavens. In fact, they tell us there are a thousand million billion stars, and those are the only ones that we can even begin to put our arms around, 10 to the 26th power. But what did the Bible say all along? Did the Bible make just inane statements like that? Uh, Moses, as he was trained in all of the, the wisdom of the uh, Egyptians, did he make statements in the Bible that reflected the learning of the day? Jeremiah, Isaiah, no. They spoke what was God-breathed. And we read in Jeremiah 33, verse 22, as the host of heaven cannot be numbered. We need to understand something. The Bible is never catching up with science. The science world is always catching up with the Bible. The Bible is true in all matters that it affirms. Or how about this, that the earth is round? You know, it wasn't until relatively not long ago we used to say Columbus sailed the ocean blue in 1492. It was science that said if you sail out through the Straits of Gibraltar, you'll go over the edge. The world is flat. They had no concept that the world is round. And yet, 2,700 years ago, Isaiah recorded in Isaiah 40, verse 22, it is he who sits above the circle of the earth. The Word of God identifies this, this globe upon which we live as a circle, as a, a, a globe. How did Isaiah know this? Because holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Or that the earth is suspended in space. For many, many years, it was believed by educated, learned people that the earth rested on the shoulders of Atlas. And that pacified people until someone said, well, what's Atlas standing on? And someone said, well, Atlas is standing on an elephant. And then someone said, what's the elephant standing on? And they said, well, the elephant is standing on a, on a sea of snakes. And it went on and on. There was no end to it. Yet Job 26 verse 7 says, he stretches out the north 
over empty space and hangs the earth. Are you ready for this? He hangs the earth on nothing. That's recorded in the book of Job. Job was a contemporary of the patriarchs. Job lived some 4,000 years ago, during the days of, of Abraham probably. How would Job be able to know this and record this? And the answer is that the Bible is the inspired Word of the living God, or that the earth is rotating. We never understood that. We always believed that the sun is rotating around the earth. And then Copernicus, during the time of the Reformation, made this great discovery. It's not the sun rotating around the earth. It is the earth that is rotating around the sun, but as it does, the earth is spinning on its axis every 24 hours, and the earth is traveling around the sun once every 365 days, and as the earth moves with the sun, the sun is circling the Milky Way. Yet Job recorded this long ago. Job 38, verse 14, the earth is changed like clay under the seal. And that word changed means turned like a cylinder, like seal, being rolled over clay. Almost like somewhat like a woman in the kitchen would be rolling her, her um, what would you call that, sweetheart? <laughs> a what? A rolling pin. Yeah. I, I use them all the time. Actually, I'm doing the laundry at that point, and I'm unable to give attention to that. But that was how Job pictured the earth rotating on its axle. Now again, why don't we open the Bible and find statements that are just inane and and have been disproved hundreds of years ago. Why do we not read that the earth is, is flat? Why do we not read that the earth is resting on an elephant? Why do we not read things that have been long since disproved? Because all Scripture is inspired by God. Uh, there are many other proofs that can be given. The, the whole evaporation process. Have you ever thought about that? that evaporation, the water rises out of the Gulf of Mexico, the, the wind blows, and it's suspended up in the cloud, and then it comes over Orlando at 2 o'clock every afternoon. And at the command of God's voice, it just releases the water, and it comes down onto the, 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 the ground. And in other parts of the country, it then goes into streams and then rivers and flows back out into the sea. Why doesn't the sea overflow? Why are rivers just always constantly flowing and there is no place else that the water goes except the evaporation process? That's just Ecclesiastes chapter 1. That's just simply Job 26 verse 8, Job 36, 27 and 28. The Bible records that whole evaporation cycle long before it was ever discovered by man. We can read the book of Leviticus and all of the laws of sanitation, et cetera, et cetera. Or that the life is in the blood, Leviticus 17.11. George Washington, they say, they just bled the man to death because he was sick, and they wanted to get the bad blood out of him. And then they discovered, no, it's not that we need to take blood out of him. In fact, he needed to have blood put into him. Yet the Bible is making scientifically accurate statements all along. Let me give you number six. The fulfilled prophecies of the Bible. We could just believe that the Bible is the Word of God on this one point alone. This is staggering. Saying, do you realize that at the time the Bible was written, 27% of the Bible was prophetic? There are some 1,817 prophecies of some nature in the Bible at the time the author wrote the Scripture. A prophecy is pre-written history. Only God knows the future, and the reason that God knows the future is because God has foreordained the future. 
God's not looking down the tunnel of time to see anything because God already knows everything, and God has already foreordained everything, and He records some of it for us in the Scripture. And we read all kinds of prophecies regarding individuals that Abraham would have a son, did he, in, the, in his latter years, that there would be rulers like Cyrus of Persia. One hundred years before Cyrus assumed the throne, his name in, in Isaiah 45 verse 1 is recorded. Would you like to predict who the President of the United States will be 100 years from today? It's impossible. But here is the Bible giving name and country of these rulers long before they're even birthed and come onto the scene. Or nations such as the, the fall of the northern kingdom or the length of Judah's captivity or empires regarding the fall of Babylon or cities such as the destruction of Tyre, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There is a, a mounting case of evidence that substantiates the perfect truthfulness of the Word of God. There are no other books in the world that are doing this. How about the prophecies concerning the Lord Jesus Christ? The greatest fulfillments of prophecy are found at the first coming of Christ. Not even the second coming, but at the first coming. It was prophesied in the Old Testament that Jesus would be born of the seed of Abraham, Jesse, and David. He would be born of a virgin called Emmanuel, born in Bethlehem. Great persons would come to adore him. There would be the killing of children in Bethlehem. He would be called out of Egypt. He would be preceded by a forerunner. He would be anointed with the Holy Spirit. He'd be a prophet like Moses, a priest after the order of Melchizedek. He would be entering into his public ministry in Galilee. He would be entering publicly into Jerusalem and come into the temple. He would be live in poverty and meekness, tenderness and compassion. He would be without deceit. He'd be full of zeal, preaching with parables, working miracles, bearing reproach. He would be rejected by his own Jewish brethren. The Jews and Gentiles would combine together against him. He would be betrayed by a friend. He would be, uh, his disciples would forsake him. He would be sold for 30 pieces of silver. And that price would be given for a potter's field. He would die with intense suffering, yet be silent under that suffering. He would be struck on the cheek. His visage would be marred. He would be spit upon and scourged. His hands and his feet would be nailed to the cross. He would be forsaken by God. He would cry out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He would be mocked. Gall and vinegar would be offered to him. His garments would be parted. Lots would be cast for his clothing. He would be numbered among the transgressors. His inter he would intercede for his murderers. He would die, but not a bone of his body would be broken. He would be pierced long before Christ crucifixion would even ever be invented. He would be buried with the rich. His flesh would not see corruption. He would be raised from the dead. He would ascend back to the right hand of God the Father. All of this recorded hundreds of years before Jesus ever entered this world. And many of these prophecies are fulfilled not by his friends, but by his enemies who stand to lose the most with their fulfillment. And many of these prophecies being fulfilled before he was born, while he's in his mother's womb, and while he is in the grave. The statistical probability that all of these prophecies would be fulfilled in one historical person Someone has said is like this, the state of Texas. It is from the top to the bottom, 801 miles. Across, it is almost that long. If the state of Texas was to be filled up with silver dollars, some think it is. <laughs> but if it was to be filled up with silver dollars, two feet deep, and one silver dollar was marked and randomly put into the state of Texas. We put you in a helicopter. You fly over the state of Texas, and you can say to the, to the pilot, 
lower me here, you roll up your sleeve, you reach down, you pick up one silver dollar, the statistical probability that you would put your hand on that one silver dollar is greater in its fulfillment than that all of these prophecies would be fulfilled in one historical figure, Jesus of Nazareth. Every one of these prophecies are validations of the inspiration, the infallibility, and the authority, and the inerrancy of the Word of the living God. Let God be found true. Let every man be found a liar, the Scripture says. Let me give you a seventh reason. The Lord's testimony to the Bible. It is by common consensus that the greatest man who has ever lived on the, pl on the planet Earth is Jesus Christ. Even false religions acknowledge the greatness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we as believers believe He is the Son of God, the Son of Man, the God-Man. James Montgomery Boyce writes, the most important reason for believing the Bible to be the Word of God written and hence the sole authority for Christians in all matters of faith and conduct is the teaching of Jesus Christ. Now, what did Jesus have to say about the Bible? Well, Jesus said in Matthew 4, verse 4, man shall not live by bread alone, and he quotes Deuteronomy 8, verse 3, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Now, Jesus didn't believe simply in the, the ideas of the Bible or the general concepts of the Bible. Jesus affirmed the inerrancy and the inspiration of every word that comes out of the mouth of God. In fact, in Matthew 5, verse 18, Jesus said, for truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law till all is accomplished. The smallest letter in the Hebrew language is the yod. It's just like our apostrophe. It's like an eyelash. It is such a small letter that you almost need a magnifying glass at times to, to spot it. And then the smallest stroke that would be like what separates in our language a lowercase l from a lowercase t. There, there's just one little stroke that separates the l from the t. Jesus is claiming inerrancy and authority for the Bible, not just every word, but every letter and every little marking on every letter of every word in the Bible. Jesus said in Luke 16, verse 17, it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one stroke of a letter of the law to fail. Jesus said it would be easier for the whole universe to go out of existence than for one little marking on one little letter of one little word in the Bible to fail. Jesus said in John 17, 17, your word is truth. If I was to ask you, what are the four stories in the Old Testament that are most ridiculed by liberals and skeptics and unbelievers, I think this is the top four. One, that there is a literal Adam and Eve. Two, that there was a real man named Noah and there was a worldwide flood. Three, that there were two towns, Sodom and Gomorrah, that were totally destroyed by fire out of heaven. And number four, that there was a great fish that swallowed the prophet Jonah. Do you know that Jesus, during His earthly ministry, at times when He was pressed the most by His enemies and His critics, Jesus affirmed all four of those stories in literal fashion. In fact, Jesus said, my second coming is like the days of Noah. Uh, Jesus said the final judgment will be like that which fell on Sodom and Gomorrah. Jesus spoke of the permanency of marriage and spoke of 
Adam and Eve and the two becoming one. And Jesus spoke of his own resurrection as the sign of Jonah the prophet, who was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so shall the Son of Man be in the earth. Jesus affirmed his resurrection, his second coming, and the final judgment on the most controversial stories in the Old Testament. No, Jesus was not explaining away the Bible. Jesus was building on the solid rock of the revelation of Scripture. In John 10, 35, the Scripture cannot be broken, he said. Luke 18, 31, all things which are written through the prophets will be accomplished. Matthew 26, 24, the Son of Man is to go just as it is written of him. In fact, Jesus put his arms around the entire Old Testament canon. For us, it is 39 books, and he affirmed the Old Testament canon in Luke 11, verse 51, when he spoke of from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah. The blood of Abel is in Genesis. The blood of Zechariah is in 2 Chronicles, which is the last book in the Hebrew Bible. That is a literary device known as inclusio, which are like bookends around the hull. It's like saying from the Atlantic to the Pacific, and what is implied, and every grain of sand in between. Jesus affirmed, not the Apocrypha, He affirmed the 39 books of the Old Testament, and in John 16, He guaranteed the New Testament canon as well. I must quickly wrap this up. Let me give you number eight. The amazing indestructibility of the Bible. Isaiah 40, verse 8, the grass withers, the flower fades away, but the Word of our God abides forever. Kings have banned it, emperors have forbid it, critics have assailed it, philosophers have denounced it, atheists have assaulted it, infidels have mocked it, and there it stands. The French skeptic Voltaire, who was so influenced by the agnostic John Locke, said centuries ago, 100 years from my day, there will not be a Bible on the earth except one that is looked upon as an antiquarian, by an antiquarian curiosity seeker. Fifty years after Voltaire's death, the Geneva Bible Society purchased the infidel's house and moved in their printing presses and began to print the Word of God. And they stacked Bibles all the way to the ceiling until no one could enter his house anymore, filled with the Word of God. And 200 years later, Christmas Eve, 1933, the British government paid the Russian government for one ancient copy of the Bible, $510,000. And on the very same day, a first edition of Voltaire on the streets of Paris sold for 11 cents. Where is the wise man of this age? Where, where is the debater of this world? No, it is the Word of God that is indestructible. Psalm 119, verse 89, forever, O Lord, your Word is settled in heaven. Listen, this isn't the book of the week, the book of the month, or the book of the year. This is the book of the ages. This book is indestructible, it is irresistible, it is inexhaustible, it is unquenchable, it is unconquerable, it is uncontainable. Matthew, or Mark 13, 31, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will abide forever. Number nine, the ethical superiority of the Bible. Listen, when we pick up this book, there is recorded in this book a transcendent moral code, a superior moral ethic that 
is, that surpasses anything else that is written in this world. Pagan uh, religions were known for their desecration of, of morality. But we read in this book, honor your father and mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. We don't pick up this book and, and read things like are in other religious books, like go kill the infidels. We pick up this book and read love your enemies. Love your wives. Love your children. Think of all that has come from the Bible, the sanctity of human life, rad, racial equality, the dignity of women, good citizenship, social justice, legal equity, selfless service, individual integrity, hard work, everything that is right and decent and honorable is set forth in the Scripture, and it is this very law that is written upon our hearts. Finally, why do we believe the Bible is the Word of God? Beyond the inward witness of the Holy Spirit, what are the essential object, uh, objective reasons why our faith is well placed in this book? Number 10, the supernatural power of the Bible. Bottom line, the proof is in the pudding. This book saves, this book sanctifies, this book separates, this book purifies, this book prunes, this book convicts, this book comforts, this book guides. Listen to Psalm 19, verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandments of the Lord are pure, enlightening the eyes. This book is a mirror. It gives us self-knowledge. We see ourselves for who we are and what we are. Every time we open this book, this book is seed. It contains the germ of life. This book is a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. This book is a fire that is in our bones. This book is a hammer that breaks the rocks to pieces. This book is a sharp-edged sword that pierces as far as the division of soul and spirit. This book is milk that feeds the heart. It is meat that substantiates our faith. No other book can tell me who I am, from whence I have come, and where I am going. No other book can tell me how to be right with God and how to live the abundant life, and no other book can look beyond the grave and tell me where I'm headed. No other book tells me about myself and makes the right diagnosis of my spiritual condition before God. We read other books and we just yawn. We read this book and something happens inside of us, and it is a miracle of the Holy Spirit of God who wrote this book. Listen, I've read other books. This book reads me. The Word of God transforms drunkards into those who are sober. It transforms prostitutes into those who are pure. It changes thieves into those who are content. The prideful are made humble. The broken are made whole. The weak are made strong. The tearful are made courageous. Martin Luther said, this book is alive. It speaks to me. It has feet. It runs after me. It has hands. It lays hold of me. Is this just another book? This book is the Word of God. It is inspired. It is inerrant. It is infallible. It is sufficient. It is authoritative. It is immutable. It is unchanging. It is sovereign. It has mastery over our lives. One anonymous writer has put it this way, and I conclude. This book contains the mind of God, the state of man, the way of salvation, the doom of sinners, and the happiness of believers. Its doctrine is holy. Its precepts are binding. Its histories are true. Its decisions are immutable. Read it and be wise. Believe it and be saved. Practice it and be holy. 
It contains light to direct you, food to support you, and comfort to cheer you. It is the traveler's map, the pilgrim's staff, the pilot's compass, the soldier's sword, and the Christian's charter. Christ is its grand subject, our good its design, and the glory of God its end. It should fill the memory, rule the heart, guide the feet. Read it slowly, read it frequently, read it prayerfully. It is a mind of wealth and health to the soul and a river of pleasure. It is given to you here in this life. It will be opened at the judgment, and it is established forever. This book tells you that God is holy and that you and I are sinful, and there is an enormous gap that separates holy God from sinful man, that there is only one way of salvation, there is only one way to be right with this God, and it is through the obedient life and substitutionary death of Jesus Christ. There is salvation in no other name, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. This Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. I trust that all of us here today have responded to the message of this book, which says there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all, the testimony born at the proper time. May you look to Christ and live. May you believe upon Christ and be saved. And all that we know of the living Word is found in this book, the written Word. Let us have great confidence and great faith in what this book says to us. Let us pray. Our Father, we thank You that You have spoken and that you have spoken in ways that even a wayfaring man can understand. We thank you for the perspicuity and the clarity and the lucidness of this book. We thank you that you have had it recorded by prophets of old and apostles, and that it contains the message of your glory and your grace and your salvation that has been made known to us. Let us not build upon the shifting sand of men's opinions and opinion poles of this world. Let us build upon the solid rock of divine revelation as revealed in this book. Father, would you open the windows of heaven and pour out your blessing upon these many people who are gathered here today. May you make them strong in their faith in the message of the Word of God. Father, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.